In Memoriam, A Lovecraftian Tragedy by Jason Kernan Chapter 1 That day, the sun escaped them. The sky was paler than bone. Among the mourners, there were restless murmurs behind cupped hands, the rustle of satin and the finest silks, the sound of a woman's muffled sobs, and beneath that, a silence, a tragic silence. They circled the sealed casket like flocked crows, as quiet and still as the dead. A man lifted a handful of earth in one pale hand and let it fall through his fingers to be blown away, surely as everything else. The light-haired woman was an enigma among them, insubstantial behind the gossamer thin black veil she wore, as still and pale as a statue wrought of marble. Her hands trembled slightly as she held her laced parasol over her head, eyes as light as her skin, gazing unseeing into the rainy mist that cloaked them. Her beauty was obscured by the grief of loss the hair like spun gold down her back, small upturned nose, mouth with its sweet red cupid's bow, and a flash of vulpine white teeth. She had never been inclined to smiles, not with her grief-stricken past and severed dreams. The loneliness that gripped her as surely as a closed fist there was a pulse beating at the base of her narrow throat, and though her posture was perfectly erect, she bore a weight on her slight sloping shoulders. Her expression was dreamy, as if she was in another world entirely. As those around her wept, her face was as solemn as a mask, revealing nothing, hiding everything. Those that gathered around her were dark-haired, chestnut and honey-brown and blue-black, as light-skinned as she, but far more worn. The women wore dark gowns that flared out at narrow hips in luxurious folds. The men, rigid in their clothing, black suits neatly pressed with their turned-down collars, chins lifted to the sky and not on the casket before them. The wind shifted, carrying with it the rain, and murmurs flickered on some tongues that this was a cursed day, darker than the ones that had preceded it, and the sky above them roiled like a tempest, the darkness closing in. The woman, widowed before her time, traced the casket with unseeing eyes. It was as if her sight was preternatural, that she sensed things the others couldn't. Blinded in one way, and seeing in all others. Her hand trembled as she grasped the parasol now, but shed no tears, not yet. Requiem, said the woman beside her. Deaths were unfortunate, the widow thought, but perhaps this one was not. Her free hand curled over itself, her sadness echoed over the graveyard, her thoughts whispered, darkness, darkness, emptiness. Still, the grief gripped her in its unrelenting fist as she stood there shrouded in mist. The fog had rolled in from the hills, she could feel it on her skin as her breath purled in the air. She wished that she could see it, but she'd long ago resolved herself to the darkness of the world, the pale black shadows on her thin eyelids. Requiem, murmured a man to her left. Tears stained her eyes, glassy and indistinct, and the widow held out a hand to capture the rain on her palm. It slipped through her fingers like blood on the leaves, to follow her into days of torment.
Chapter 2 She hadn't always been unseen, blinded to the light of the world. She had once known brightness, the sun, the colour, the lush, unspoiled green of the Victorian countryside, the bloom of the roses in the glass vases, the shadows that chased the light, the smiles writ on her friends' faces, the blossoming of eyes opening to the sun, her mother's low laugh and her father's rougher one, their hands brushing the soft skin on her cheek. But the unseen darkness had welcomed her like nothing else ever had. They told her what she had witnessed was impossible. They told her what she had witnessed had never happened. A figment of a child's imagination, trauma and deep shock. That her parents' deaths were both horrible misfortunes or repulsive acts of a human's folly, but surely not that monster concocted in the child's imagination who had wrapped its limbs so lovingly around her parents, ripping them to shreds, their innards turned inside out, and their ruptured bodies perforated by what seemed an arsenal of tentacle form piercings that had drilled all life from them both. These sights she had witnessed had marked her since that day, possessed by these images of writhing and wriggling tentacles. She had become a creature of the night, who walked the hallways after dusk fell, and blanketed the world in an uneasy silence. Now she was the monster. It was impossible to explain the memory of it, endlessly haunting the great creature suddenly emerging from the bleak shadows. Its unseeing eyes, the size of dinner plates, its appendages reaching out like a starving cockroach to tentatively feel and feed off the darkness in the air. Its sleek, dark skin, the way its tentacles rippled through the skein of summer, as if it was suspended underwater. She would never forget it, the last gasping breath of her father, or the tormented cries of her mother. She fled under the stairwell in her stained gown, covering her eyes from the ghastly terror. As the years passed, the guilt would gnaw at her, an impossible ache in the pit of her belly and the cavity of her chest where her heart had once been. Unbearable guilt, unbearable pain, she should have done more, she thought. She should have tried to save them, as they had so frequently saved her. She'd been a sheltered child, hidden away from the world of purity and innocence, tender and gentle and shy. But the monster had taken all that away from her, as it had taken everything else. It had stolen her from herself, Nightmares became her companion after their deaths, chasing the sleep from her. She would lay with her eyes open, staring at the vaulted ceiling above, trying to will her mother and father back into existence. When they didn't return, she became desperate, knowing she would be haunted by those sights forever, that thing wrapping its tentacles around them like claws, indifferent to their screams and ravenous for death. The torment was unbearable, the memory and all that accompanied it. So she gathered the herbs in their garden in open arms, chose carefully which ones would cause irreversible blindness. She had always been skilled with poultices and poisons, the stilling of a heartbeat underneath a practiced hand, and this was no different. The last thing she desired was to see. The pain she could stand, the grief she couldn't. One droplet in each eye was all it took. The orphanage she was sent to was hollow and reeked of misspent lives, of echoes in the dark. Newly blinded, she learned to see without her eyes, the feeling of coarse wood underneath her hands, the smell of smoke curling in the air and the feeling of wind on her turned cheek. The girl learned it was not so hard to make her way in the world without sight.
but her surroundings came alive under the shield of night. When evening fell, she would walk the halls, one hand against the cold stone walls, the world so dark that she didn't cast a shadow. The other children didn't understand her, the grief, the film over her pale eyes, how she startled at things that others couldn't hear. Monsters scuttling under floorboards and the whispers of unseen leviathans in the dark. A few miles from the orphanage, there stood a lonely manor on a hill. All turrets and empty halls and the smell of the intoxicating flowers which blossomed in the little garden. Much was talked about of this manor in the neighbouring villages. Stories of the likes that started myths or legends. When summer cast its shadow over the countryside, the orphans were sent there. The children's yearly holiday. A sweet escape from the rest of the world. It was there where her story continues. Chapter 3 The Lord of the Manor seemed proud and lonely and proud of that loneliness. The children never saw him. He kept to the dark, just as the girl did. In that way, they were the same. In others, they were vastly different. His butler was the only one allowed in his presence and the only one who resided in the manor. A man with an odd demeanour. A man raised to serve, pale as bone, with dark hair and shallow eyes, an equally dark suit, pressed to immaculate perfection. A man of foreign origin, with no one in the village who was ever able to place his accent, nor his bizarre inflections, the way he spoke, and sometimes laughed. His skin was drawn tight over his bones. The Lord's appearance, on the other hand, had always remained a mystery. It was whispered that he wandered about through the nightly shadows, frolicking with beasts of the night. But these were the tales the maids would murmur amongst them. The rumour went that the Lord was from a far and unknown land his features different from that of the local folk. But these were all assumptions, as the Lord remained hidden in the shadows, shying away from light and life. When the orphans arrived for the summer, he secluded himself to these shadows. There was only the stretch of his silhouette, the silence in him that did not speak back. There was one that he seemed to watch more than the others. This was the blind girl, lovely in her deference and silent as a mouse. When dawn came, she arrived with the others and spent her time carving monstrosities from clay. Her hands moved swiftly, easing over the sloping clay, willing the impossible surfaces to yield and they were always horrible creatures, born of spite and loss, creatures with tentacles for their faces and great silent eyes. When she carved, he watched, his long shadow scything the morning light. The teachers were told to encourage her, to push her talents. She was allowed the freedom to continue her work and become acquainted with the shapes and forms of these strange creatures, their anatomy and texture. It was something she'd look back on later, that she would recollect in misery. The manor was sorrowful and ancient with what had been done to it. Ages slipped into myth and then slipped away into memory. Here the torches were lit to keep out the dark, but they rarely burned for long. The bitter wind from the high windows quenched them. It was a lonely place, a place of loss, a place of grief. Perhaps that was why the girl loved it so, 
Its halls stood empty, dust filming every surface. Within this emptiness, a quiet, terribly loud. Chapter 4 As the years slipped away and countless summer holidays had passed, the blind girl, still quiet and unsure, and ridden with grief, had become a woman. She had become a creature of angelic beauty, or so she was told. But she could not see this, and so it mattered little to her. By now she was no longer a stranger to the Lord and his manor. She could have walked these hollow empty halls in her sleep. Between the young woman and the Lord, they built an uneasy friendship, but a friendship nonetheless. He opened her to the wider world, and she allowed him into her life. He taught her the fine arts, the taste of fine cuisine, more refined sculpture, and a plethora of foreign languages and cultures. It did not take long before they formed a bond of affection between them. She had grown very fond of the Lord, his presence yet always distant. He resembled that lost love she had once so cherished. An unconditional love that was ripped apart that one night. That one night she could never unsee. The Lord's love towards the blind girl seemed to lift some sort of gnawing weight from his shoulders. Her presence and her kindness made him more human. Her purity, softening this incredible burden he had been carrying with him for decades. The story had reached the surrounding villages, and was the talk of the town. It was said that the Lord and the blind girl were to be bonded in wedlock. All sorts of tittle-tattle spread throughout the hills and countryside, each story stranger than the next, the consummation of an angel with the devil. Her last night she was a maiden, the wedding night, as if in a dream she walked down the long unfurling hall of the manor, towards the smoky blue-green light. The walls here were panelled wood, with bare carpet underfoot, and paintings on the walls, images of men and women, now likely dead, dressed in clothing of the past, sad and still and mournful. Their eyes seemed to observe her as she passed, yet she could not observe them. The very air was slowed. She walked as if through water, as if at the bottom of the sea. The lace lingerie she wore nearly faded into the lightness of her skin, and slowly she pulled at her garter belt, before walking onward. It was as if, in that moment, she could see but the green light was pulling her on, guiding her down the hall towards its violent brightness. The room she entered was green and blue, haloed in smoke. Everything had the soft unease of a dream. Appearing out of the smoke, hands, or what seemed to be hands, went to her. How many, she could not be sure, rippling along her waist the gentle swell of her breasts and the curve of her hips. Countless hands, she thought, countless. Though she could not see, she closed her eyes. The hands rose up, and as she floated away into some fevered dream, they then laid her down gently. And there she lay in all her angelic beauty, on what appeared to resemble some kind of ancient altar, bearing indecipherable symbols of some past ancient culture, covered with cloth of crimson and symbols of gold. Chapter 5 Long ago, she had not believed she would ever marry. How the passage of time changed everything. The room had become dark and still 
haloed in light and smoke. But she wasn't alone. What she thought had been hands were truly something else entirely. Something from her memory alone. Something she had many times sculptured out of clay. They felt so oddly reminiscent. Tentacles. Strangely gentle now. And as they caressed her bare white skin, she moaned. Shadows that she could not see ghosted over her breasts, her hips, driving her to an almost unbearable height. Tongues licked her skin, eliciting tiny imperceptible shivers of pleasure. Shadows softly curled over her high breasts and then drifted between her legs, making her drowsy, slow, entirely prepared for what would come next. Truly, she desired what would come next. There was almost no pain from the eerie penetration, the tentacles easing within her. Images flashed through her retina, frames of tentacles ripping flesh, the whipping of skin. She had not expected the pleasure, the heat in the pit of her belly, and she also had not expected the fear. Yet, whatever fear there was within her seemed to vanish as she was plunged into again and again and again, spearing her pleasure to inconceivable heights, making her body shiver and a sharp high-pitched cry she hadn't even known she could make was emitted from her mouth. Around her, the world shifted. The still grey aura of the manor faded into nothingness and instead was wreathed in blue and green light. And though she could not see it, the blind girl knew it was there. And though she could not feel it, something small was stirring within her now. The bloom of new life. Chapter 6 As the sands of time continued to blow away into the wind, the funeral continued on around the blind widow. The rain had not yet stopped pouring, and the onlookers circled about the graveyard like crows. A flash of light, a lifting of smoke, and the blind widow was back in the manor beside the casket itself. A memory sparked those grotesque past images onto the rear of her dead eyes. Though she could not see, she now knew what lay inside. The bequeathed, her significant other, finally resting peacefully in death. The guilt that resided inside of him had finally been eaten away. If there was ever a good reason for a closed casket funeral, the Lord's viewing was to be sealed tight as his fate. Before the closing of the coffin, there it was, that glimpse of the Lord's face. It was truly monstrous. Perhaps it was better then that she was blind, that she'd never had to see it. His face bore two rows of eyes, three in each. Eyes that stared emptily to the dark, vaulted ceiling. Eyes that were now as unseeing as hers. His face was almost a sort of art, of something sculptured by a child's cruel hand after suffering a nightmare. The face itself was long and reptilian, distorted and disfigured, shadowed and drawn, and where his nose should have been, there were rows of tentacles, now unmoving, now no longer a danger. Warts blossomed on his scaly skin, an abomination even to the eyes of his faithful and trusting butler. And after the blind widow dipped her head to kiss his ravaged forehead, she stepped back in silence. The butler closed the coffin, sealing the secret into eternity. A small child 
delicately wrought and bearing her mother's loveliness in the pert nose, wide eyes, delicate fall of cornerstone blonde hair, approached her mother, the widow, quietly. She was dressed in a modest gown that hid the growing shape of her body, the slight curve of her waist. Her mother turned at the sound of footsteps and smiled. She had never seen her daughter's face, but she immediately recognized the sound of her footsteps, the feeling of her silky hair underneath her tentative fingers, the sweetness of her laugh. In this, she did not even long to see, to hear, to feel, to know was enough. Now she ran her hands lightly over her daughter's face, gently, kindly, and the girl let her do it. She smiled shyly. Light of my life, the widow cooed. I can feel that you have your mother's eyes, nose, lips and mouth. The daughter nodded slowly, all sweetness their thoughts promptly jumping back to that one night, that one night. There the little girl sat alone, covered in blood, her sweet face possessed by spirits of ancient deities. The light was receding from the windows, the night very still, until she leaned forward, her teeth sharp and vulpine and white that had torn the Lord apart entirely. He did not so much as fight, finally knowing it would all be over soon. The girl crouched over his body, feasting on his strange and bizarre innards, the heart and the brain altered by whatever abyss he had appeared from. A peculiar twist of fate, or maybe not so, as the Lord did not seem startled by this predestination. He seemed oddly relieved that his cycle would finally be completed. He knew that whatever one was owed would come eventually. What one does in the past frequently returns to us. She too was also partly monster, and monsters hunted. The predatorial instinct she had inherited had now made him the prey. He had gotten what he was owed, a silent sleep, an end to that guilt-ridden nightmare, a death six feet under in the harsh Victorian countryside, never to feel the sun again. The rain returned, and the widow at the funeral bowed her fine, pale head. When she was called to, she stepped forward, a white rose in her white hand, and laid it upon the dark coffin. With this white rose she laid to rest the memory of the three people she loved so, her parents and her husband, commiserating the bittersweet concoction of love and loss. She blinked her pale eyes once, feeling the surge of grief within her chest, the flutter of fear, it felt as if a fist had gripped her throat. For a moment, she could not speak. No words could struggle out of her mouth. A tear fell from her eye, trailing down her cheek. A final goodbye to the ones she had truly loved, never to feel their touch again. She stood wreathed in grief, very still, Though the wind was cold and fierce that day, it seemed to bother none of those gathered around the casket. There was just wind, and cold, and silence, a silence that did not speak and never would. The widow lifted her head to the grey sky, with unseeing eyes, misted with tears and grief, it was impossible to see whether her expression was a smile or a grimace born of sorrow. She felt the grasp of her daughter's hand gripping onto her for dear life, and she was guided forward 
towards the abyss of loving light.